Hello, and welcome to VAC's webinar, Direct-to-Consumer Meat Sales, Trends, and Data. Our guest presenter is Katie Oltloff, and I'm Samantha Gasson, VAC's Humane Farming Manager, and I will be moderating this session. Thank you for joining us. Before we dive right in, let me take a minute or two to do a few quick introductions. Food Animal Concerns Trust, or FACT, is a national nonprofit organization headquartered in Illinois that works to ensure that all food producing animals are raised in a humane and healthy manner. We do this by supporting humane farmers through our humane farming program, promoting policies that make food from animals safe and healthy to eat through our safe and healthy foods program, and generally help consumers make informed food choices. Please visit our website at foodanimalconcerns.org. So, sorry, foodanimalconcernstrust.org. <laughs> at this time, I'm very pleased to introduce our esteemed presenter, Katie. Oh, is it is it Olthoff or Olthoff? Top. It's a silent. Oh, did you hear me there? Okay. I didn't. So it's how oh, you sorry. sorry. I said it's old top with a silent H. Old top. Okay. I yes. forgot to ask you. Sorry. I mean, I asked you last time, but anyway, because this is Katie's That's okay. second time with us. So, um, so Katie is an Iowa farm wife and mom. She has been working in the, in ad communications and marketing for over 10 years. She's a former teacher and small business owner who loves to host webinars and provide coaching for farmers to help them grow their businesses. Katie co-founded Chop Local in 2020 and was named one of Cattle Business's weeklies, weeklies top 10 industry leaders under 40 in 2021. She was voted most likely to be on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire in her senior class. I still think that's really funny. And believes life is better when you can see cows out of your kitchen window. But we've discussed this before, out of every window. I should change out that. Out of every window. window. That's right. <laughs> We are lucky to have Katie with us today to share her share her experience and expertise. So without further ado, I will turn the floor over to you, Katie. Please take it away. All right. Awesome. I am excited for this. I see everybody saying hi in the chat. And there's some names that I recognize, but lots of farms and names that I've never heard, too. So very excited to share with you guys today. Um as Samantha said, I do really, I was voted most likely to be on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. I really enjoy learning new things and then sharing that information with other people. And one of the ways that we have done that recently is through our direct consumer meet survey. And so I need to share my screen now, right, Samantha? You're not seeing it right now. Is that correct? Yes, please share your screen. Okay, let's see. Okay. We good now? We are. Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. I'm using a different system than I usually use. And we did test it, but it's always a little bit, there's a little bit of unknown here. So um, to start out with a little bit more about Chop Local, uh, we launched Chop Local in 2020, really because of the imbalance that we saw between what farmers, livestock farmers are receiving for their animals and what the entire meat industry is worth. Uh, farmer's share of the food dollar in the livestock industry has been decreasing and continues to decrease. The consolidation and concentration we see in meat packers is leaving um, not very much competition. So it's hard for farmers to get fair prices for their livestock. And so in 2020, when consumers increasingly turned towards buying their meat and their groceries online, we really saw that as an opportunity to help more farmers get their meat online. Uh, so we operate the Chop Local Marketplace, which is basically a farmer's market for meat in the United States. We also received a USDA grant, um, the Farmer's Market Promotion Program grant, to provide free and low cost educational resources for farmers selling direct to consumer, as well as seafood harvesters and small meat processors. We really mostly operate in the meat and seafood world, uh, but a lot of the things that we cover, I think are applicable to other types of farms as well. But today we are going to focus again on meat. And one of the things that we have done with our grant is we do a big annual survey to find out what types of things you all, meat processors and farmers, need help with. And so today I'm going to go over the results of our second annual survey. The survey was done nationwide. Uh, the respondents were primarily livestock producers, 
And as an incentive to get people to answer this survey, we do send a $500 Visa gift card to one random respondent. And then the results of the survey really guide our educational programming. And as we go through this, as we go through these results, I'll share with you some of the different things that we've created or done that relate directly to the survey results. Just a quick overview, and we'll do some of this at the end too, but here's what we saw. We saw, in general, the average sales of our meat producers, our farmers selling direct to consumer, average sales increased. The percent of producers that are selling USDA inspected cuts versus uh, state inspected or custom butchered increased from about 65% last year to 75% this year. The percent of producers shipping their meat increased. And then we also saw an uptick in the use of Instagram and Facebook groups for marketing. What we saw decreasing this year is the difficulty finding harvest appointments. Now I know that that may be different regionally, but you know, through the pandemic, we just saw that it was almost impossible to find a harvest or a processing appointment anywhere. We're seeing that ease up in some parts of the country. Uh, we also saw that shipping costs decreased, and I'll talk more about that later on as well. So here's kind of uh, the data around the demographics of our survey. 322 responses in 46 states. 92% of the responses were livestock farmers selling meat. So from here on out, if I give any data or any numbers, you can assume that we took out those butcher shops and lockers and it is the livestock farmers that I'm talking about here. Uh, we didn't really have a big enough sample size of the butcher shops or lockers to really get a lot of inf good information out of that. So we kind of threw them out <laughs> and we really focused on the livestock farmers here instead. Now we asked them, do you have, or what do you have as sales channels? Do you have a website? Do you have a website with an ordering form? Do you have a website with out online ordering? Or do you have a website with an online store? 55% said that they have a website with an online store. And I believe last year it was 53%. So there was very little change here, which I thought was really interesting. I also think it's interesting that when you compare this to USDA data, I believe the 2017 Census of Agriculture said that farmers selling direct to consumer, only like 9% of them had an online store. Most of the farmers that we talked to um, or that responded to this survey are very active online or on social media. You know, that's how they found out about the survey. And so maybe it makes sense that they are more likely to have that online store. Every year we ask, what are the most important things to grow your meat business? And number one, both years in a row has been finding new customers. Um, last year, decreased time and labor needs to run my business was ranked second, but that dropped down in the running to number four. Uh, adding or improving a shipping process was number two, or creating or improving website or online store was number three. There were also under the others, there were things like need more land, need, you know, better breeding stock, things like that. But we really focus obviously on the sales portion of it. I mentioned this earlier, but we asked, are you selling custom harvest? Over 50% are. Are you selling state inspected retail cuts? About 25% were, or are you selling USDA inspected retail cuts, and that's about 75%. You can see this doesn't add up to 100 because obviously the farmer might be selling some custom harvested and some retail cuts. Um, but we did see this uptick from 65% in 2022 to 75% in 2023 on those USDA inspected cuts, which I think in some areas of the country, we seem to be seeing more USDA inspected processors. So that could be playing a part in that. We ask average annual meat sales. And I know in some of the questions that came in beforehand, people were asking about consumer trends or consumers pulling back on spending. Um, either we had a very different sample the second year than we did the first year, or our consumers are not necessarily pulling back or our farmers are getting better at sales. Because last year, 
Farmers without e-commerce were selling just under $50,000 in meat, and with e-commerce, they were selling about $77,000. But this year, we saw farms with without e-commerce selling $74,000, and with e-commerce selling about $105,000. So those numbers jumped, jumped dramatically from 2022 to 2023 which I think is really interesting and pretty interesting to know if that aligns with what you are seeing in your area as well. Now, one of the things that we ask is how long have you had your online store? And then we look at the average annual meat sales associated with that. And the big takeaway here is that you need to have your online store for a little while before you really start to see it contributing uh, to a large part of your farm income. So starting out the first six months, you may not see that high of sales, but then as time goes on, you can see that it comes up and kind of levels off a little bit. This is a very similar um, chart. We have what percentage of your sales come in online? So most of the farms that we surveyed were also selling at a farmer's market or selling wholesale or um, selling on the farm. And so we asked what percentage of your sales come in online. Across the board, the average was about 43%. But again, you can see that if you are newer to having an online store, it's gonna be a much smaller percentage, but that is going to grow and level off. We think it's super interesting that two to five years was higher than five to 10 years um, and have a couple theories on that, but uh, just really interesting there. Not sure if maybe these farms that have been online for five to 10 years have maybe a slightly more outdated platform or something like that. Okay, this slide looks at what products were these farms selling. Takeaway here is that beef or pork plus at least one other meat will get you the largest sales volume. Now it's really important when we look at these sales numbers, we tried to ask what their pro what their revenue was like compared to, compared to their sales or what their profit margin was like, and we didn't really get great data. So it could be that a farm that is selling less is actually netting more money depending on what their expenses are. So we're just looking at sales data here. But if you have one meat and it's not beef, so this is if you're just pork, just lamb, just chicken, just goat, um, your sales average was about $40,000, okay? Beef only was about 73,000. Then when you look at these two or three different meats, it goes a lot higher. If you don't have beef, you're a little bit lower again. Katie, Samantha, can I ask, can I ask yeah. a question? So yeah. when, is this, this includes um, freezer beef, or is it and cuts or is it just cuts? It's freezer beef as well. Okay. Yep. We just asked, what are your gross sales of meat? And so that would include the freezer beef or custom exempt as well as the retail cuts. So, but like I said, I don't know the numbers for production. I don't know if, um, you know, maybe lamb, you might have a much higher gross margin. I don't, I don't know that very well. So. Okay, this slide here, the three different colors of green, the lightest color, these are farms that are selling less than $100,000 a year. The middle green is farms that are selling 100 to $200,000 of meat a year. And the dark green are farms that are selling more than 200,000. The takeaway here is that the dark green, more likely to have an online store, more likely to offer shipping, more likely to have more than one type of meat. This, I should have done this part of the, I should have done that one backwards, so I apologize. And more likely to have subscription boxes. Although I will say, I don't think I have another slide on subscription boxes, but overall subscription boxes do not seem to make a huge difference in farm sales. Um, we asked a few questions about it and people generally said, some of them said that it was helpful. Some of them said that it didn't really make a big difference in there in their business, so. Uh, Katie, I actually have a question that probably is is relevant um, and I don't want to um, yeah. miss it. Um, Brendan asks, um, 
when you're talking about one other kind of beef, is it uh, one other kind of meat, beef plus something? Is did do you have any data on whether or not that was beef plus chicken or was that beef plus pork? Um, could you could you just um, maybe maybe tell us a little bit more about what that means? Yeah, let me go back. So um, it could have been any of them. It could have been beef plus pork. It could have been beef plus chicken. Could have been beef plus lamb. Could really have been any of them. I didn't break it down further than that. Now this column that says two meats. That would be two meats that don't include beef. So maybe it's chicken and turkey or chicken and lamb or something like that. Um, if you have more specific questions, I, I don't have all of the data in front of me and it would take me a little while to dig through it, but I could, you can email me. My email's on the screen there. You could email me and I can try to come up with the answers for you there, so. Okay, so takeaway here. Farms with more sales, have an online store, offer shipping, sell more than one type of meat, and offer subscription boxes. And I will point out also that these are correlations. It not, it's not necessarily causation. We did not ask them, what were your sales before you had an online store and what were your sales after? We didn't ask them, what were your sales before you offered shipping and what were your sales after offering shipping? So we don't really know if these farms have higher sales because they offer these things or if they had higher sales, they have more revenue, and so they're able to expand into these other outlets like the online store and shipping. I, I feel pretty strongly that an online store will increase your sales, but I do wanna point that out, that the way that we gather this data, I can't say that with complete certainty either, okay? This one, again, okay, Farms that we're selling, this dark green bar is farms that are selling over 200,000. The middle green bar is farms selling over 100,000. This is their comfort level with marketing. So for those two groups, 43% of them said very comfortable with marketing and 40% said very comfortable with marketing compared to the farms selling less than 100,000 who said somewhat or not comfortable with marketing. Um, and so again, are they more comfortable with marketing because they're seeing success and they've been doing it longer and that's why they have higher sales? Or do they have higher sales because they're more comfortable with marketing? I suspect that it goes hand in hand and that the more you increase your marketing knowledge, the higher your sales are going to be, right? And so that's one of the reasons that we've created the uh, different webinars that we do, the different resources about marketing. Again, going back to one of those first slides, Number one thing that people said was that they needed help finding more customers. And so that's why we focused on marketing. I know FACT has great webinars on like production and things like that. We've tried to keep ourselves very niche down into the marketing for this reason, really. We also asked what your marketing spend is. And for farms that are selling $200,000 or more, they're spending a significantly more a significantly higher number of dollars on marketing. Our general guideline and really a business general guideline is that about 10% of your sales should be spent on marketing. In the low margin business, that can be really difficult and that might mean time, not necessarily money. Um, but we do see a correlation there with higher marketing spend and higher sales as well. Okay, I, this is a slide I already showed you once, but it's gonna lead into the next slide here. So farms without e-commerce are selling about $74,000 a year in meat, okay? If we average together all of the farms with e-commerce, they're selling about 105,000. Now, if we look at e-commerce without shipping, it's around 81,000. But if we add shipping to the mix, so if you go from no e-commerce to e-commerce with shipping, the average went up almost double for the sales volume. And so this again leads into one of the biggest topics that we focus on at Chop Local is how to ship your meat efficiently. And we actually have a webinar coming up next week on February 13th, all about shipping frozen meat. 
Uh, and we have other resources about that on our blog and things like that as well. So e-commerce with shipping is associated with sales that are almost double that of farms that are not using e-commerce at all. And then we asked, what is your average cost per shipment? And we saw, um, you see a lot of people grouped here kind of in this $30 to $40 per order range. And then you see these outliers that are saying that it's $60 plus. Um, we've seen a lot of people go from saying $60 plus for an order to getting down into that $25 to $35 a range per order. And again, that's what we focus on in our trainings is how to ship efficiently, um, cost effectively, and really with high accuracy, you know, not a lot of failures. We did see when you compare 2022 to 2023, we saw the average um, went down a little bit. And obviously that's not because things are getting cheaper. It's, I think it's really because people are getting better at shipping their meat which is fantastic because that's exactly what we set out to help people do. If you're looking at this and you're like, I don't have any idea how I would get my shipping costs down that low, then I highly recommend you sign up for our webinar. So takeaways here, farms with the highest sales are more likely to sell beef or pork plus at least one other meat, have an online store, ship their meat, Offer subscription boxes, maybe, but I don't see as, as tight of a correlation there. Uh, but we do see a really strong correlation with farms being more comfortable with their marketing. And so some of the things that we have worked on with partners through our grant are, we have a webinar on pricing for profit with Matt LaRue, which Matt is from Cornell and he's fantastic at this. Um, and I know there were a couple questions that came in beforehand about pricing. And so Matt is perfect to handle that. Uh, we have a webinar about SEO and Google business, which is great for marketing. Um, we did have a couple questions about farmers markets. We have a webinar from a couple that a couple of our chop local vendors did a webinar on farmers market best practices and what they've done to make that successful. Uh, let's see what else. A lot of different options here, and this is just a few of them. And then I do want to point out for selling online, we actually just developed an online course to help farms get started or really enhance their sales online. So we have plenty of time for questions, Samantha. That went faster than I thought it would. We really do, don't we? <laughs> I know, and I'm happy to go back to any of the slides or... If, if you want me to dig up some other data, I can, you know, if you have specific questions, I can look in, in my other, I've got a kind of a internal summary that we use too. So I will pull that up. Okay. So we have that ready. All right. And I will say Matt LaRue is pretty amazing. And um, he uh, actually works pretty closely with um, NC Choices. Actually, I think he's one of, he's one of the consultants for them. And we had Lee Minas from NC Choices doing a um, pricing your products webinar um, a few weeks, a few months ago, back in November. So Fantastic. Will, yeah, yeah, I will send that link to his webinar in the follow up okay. email. And I just put a link in the chat for um, for the Chop Local webinar. So anybody, I'm going to sign up for that one about shipping meat. I, we do not currently ship meat, but I keep saying I want to. And then I get down to it and I'm too busy and I never do it. So do you have USDA inspected products? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, and I think I, I can also can, I can sell um, I can sell my uh, my poultry as well. Right. It's inspected on farm. I mean, it's um, it's not inspected. You. Mm -hmm. This I is, know, we I just talked about this. We did. Because it's not an inspected product. Um, I know I can sell to other states that have, or I think I can, to other states that have, um, that are poultry, have the poultry exemption, uh, ah. but I don't know that I can, I don't know if I, I may be lying. I don't know. I shouldn't say anything, actually. I should keep my, my mouth shut. Well, I'll find, I will find that out for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Samantha and I talked about this right beforehand that um, 
the because there were some questions about regulations that came in beforehand and yes there's somebody in the chat saying poultry depends on the state there is just a patchwork of state regulations and federal and so it's really hard for people like us to give advice about what is legal in one state or you know allowed in one state because it just seems to be different everywhere and sometimes the state employees don't even seem to really understand it so yeah yeah well for sure if you're under state inspection you cannot go um to another state and i right. i would imagine it would be the same for the the poultry but the poultry is an uninspected product so that's why it's different it's an exemption so, um, but Margaret says that in Missouri, she was told that she could not sell her poultry under the Missouri poultry exemption under overstate lines. In Ohio, overstate lines, poultry has to be used, USDA. Okay, so just a reminder, if you guys have any questions for Katie, please put those in the Q&A. So um, somebody else would like some clarification on the difference between the one meat versus no beef categories. I feel like we've already, um, do you want to just go over that one more time just to be sure, because we've got the time just to be sure um, yes. they understand. Um, That's a really good question, actually. Now you might make me stumble on that. One meat versus no beef. Okay, so and I don't have the slide up again, but no beef could have been like, chicken, turkey, and lamb, but one meat could have been only lamb or only turkey or only chicken. Does that make sense? The big takeaway, it doesn't make a ton of sense, does it? The big takeaway that I see is that if you look at these numbers and you are a lamb producer and you're like, the average is 120, but I've only, I'm only selling 40,000. I must be failing at this. I want you to know that that doesn't mean that you are failing. It means that there are some other variables in there and type of meat that you are selling is one of those variables. And so don't necessarily try to compare yourself to the beef producers or pork producers or something like that. So. And I think your point of gross versus net is really important because it costs a lot more to raise a pig than it does to raise a cow. True. Yeah. Unless, unless and you I, take I, land I, into consideration and all taxes and all that kind of stuff. That might be a little bit different, but. Yeah. And, and everybody, I mean, there's so many differences between, I'm not going to, did you inherit land or do you have a land payment? Was there fence in place or did you put fencing in? Did you, you know, like everybody's costs are different too. And so, um, we just are looking at those gross sales because like I said, when we asked about profit, the numbers got really wonky really fast. So mm -hmm. yeah, not I everybody think, is as good at um, keeping doing their, you know, yep. I was just going to say, and I think that that could be because a lot of producers don't necessarily know their cost of production. And that's something yeah. that Matt LaRue focuses on a lot too. So yes, that's one of the most important things you can do. All right, so Brendan, actually, the, the earlier question that he had, the gist of his earlier question is really beef margins for me are much better than pork and chicken. So if I have the capacity to add poultry or pork, does your data have any indication which moves more beef? I don't. And I'm trying to think anecdotally if I have any data, and I really don't. But I will tell you, if you can get USDA inspected retail cuts of chicken, cut up chicken, and you can do that reason at a reasonable price, that sells well online. Um, and partly because there's less competition because it is so hard to find USDA inspected poultry processors that will cut it up at a reasonable cost, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so okay. I... That would be really interesting to sit down and look at your situation and what would make the most sense for you. But I think it would really depend on the processors in your area um, and what's available to you. All right. So Josh actually clarified with the poultry exemption. I told you I should have kept my mouth shut. I don't sell across state lines my poultry. I just do it at the farmer's market and online um, for pickup on the farm. But so he also says that... He says, Sam, you need to stop giving people advice because you don't know what. No, he didn't say that. He said, <laughs> <laughs> Under the exemption for poultry, you can only sell within the state of origin process. You can ship the, you can ship the poultry within the state. Within the state. Yeah. And that's one thing we talk about shipping out of state most of the time. But if you're in Texas, 
plenty of customers in Texas for you to ship to, too, right? So, yeah. Amanda asks, um, I'm curious how you reach the audience for the survey. Yeah, so we actually used online directories like um, it, like the the NC Choices directory. And we just sent an email that said, we're doing this survey grant funded. Can you please respond? And so, again, when I said, um, you know, we had a much higher percentage of respondents that are using an online store than what USDA's numbers were. Those respondents, a lot of them came from online directories. Um, and so that shows that they have some level of tech savviness to sign themselves up for this directory to begin with. Okay, Miriam asks, what is your opinion on prices versus weight by, versus payment units by uh, for meats? And we actually, you covered that last time, which I thought- We covered it last good. time. Samantha yeah. and I are in total agreement. We feel very strongly. We want you to, um, we call it by weight ranges versus exact weight, but it's basically the payment by unit um, idea. So the weight ranges is what both of us recommend. We go really in depth into that in our course because um, we have a section on pricing that includes some Matt LaRue resources. And then I really talk about why I feel so strongly about that and how to price that way. Katie asks, I currently sell non-organic, non-certified organic chicken that is processed at a USDA certified butcher. Do you see a larger, do you see a larger interest for certified organic from a marketing standpoint? So I and don't have I, a ton can, of data on this. Can I add to that? And also um, humane certification. Do you find yeah. any like the humane certifications? Yep. So this is this is a I feel like an extension personnel right now when I say it depends and I can't <laughs> give a flat answer for that. What I have seen from certified organic is that it your costs increase so much, it increases the pricing so much that it is prohibitive at times for customers to purchase. What I have found, and I feel, I feel very confident saying this, is that when customers know that they can get answers about the way that their meat is raised, the labeling does not matter as much because they feel so much more confident psychologically knowing that they can talk to you about it. Um, and they, and when they know the farmer, they tend to trust the farmer. And so I'm not huge on labels if they cost you a lot of money. Um, the other thing that I will say, and I actually just created a, a, a handout about this, is when you are describing your farm, um, it's really important that when you use labels or you talk about the features of your farm, you also wanna describe what the benefits of those features are, whether they are benefits to the animals, to the environment or to the consumer. And so an example of that would be if it's, uh, you know, I looked at a processor site the other day and the, the processor said USDA inspected and animal welfare certified. I think that was the phrasing. Um, and I want them, that's a feature. I want them to expand and say, and the benefit of that is that you can rest assured that your animal was treated with care up until the moment that it was processed or harvested and processed for your consumption. You know, so what does animal welfare certified really mean? It means that you can rest at ease. What does USDA inspected mean? It means that it, um, you know, there was an extra set of eyes on it to ensure that it's safe for you to consume. So I guess... That's kind of a long way uh, and roundabout way of saying if you use those labels like that, they can be effective, but it's more effective for you to talk about why you're doing something and what the benefit is to the consumer. Okay, so um, uh, I'm not even gonna try and pronounce your name. It's A-I-L-A, -A, Alaya, it's pretty. Um, any tips for getting started with shipping? Yeah. Uh, watch our webinar. <laughs> <laughs> um, really briefly, we don't typically recommend dry ice. It's expensive and prohibitive. It's hard to use. We really like um, gel packs or there is a resource shippingcoolers.com makes these ice blankets. It's a small business. You actually have to call them to order. But these ice blankets are fantastic and we really recommend those. We also recommend that you, if you can gather styrofoam coolers that are recycled from 
pharmacy vet hospital and recycle those coolers. That's a great way to start. Test it this time of year. Um, send it, you know, locally. It probably costs you, I know it costs us less than $15 to send a box of meat across the state of Iowa. So if you have a friend that lives a couple hours away, take that investment, ship them the meat and see how it turns out. Um, we go into a lot more detail on getting discounts. And I did see someone in the chat asked about Chop Local uh, if they off, if we offer a shipping discount. There are services out there like Shippo and ShipStation that you can sign up for. I think they're both $9.99 a month and we work with ShipStation um, and they get you the huge discount, which makes a big difference versus walking into your UPS or FedEx store. It's gonna save you, I mean, 50 to 70% by using one of these services. Hannah asks, do you have any data on number of employees or payroll associated with gross, gross sales? We did not ask that, that would, at all. That would be no. good to know. Yeah. That would be really interesting. Um, yeah. One of the things that I would anticipate being a problem with that is farmers tend to undervalue their time. So the time, I mean, the payroll that you pay to someone else is very black and white. You can see that. But I don't think there's very many of us here. And I know my husband certainly doesn't track his hours on the farm. So that gets a little bit yeah. wishy-washy too. Well, that's one of the things that I am determined to do this year. And one, not only tracking your own time, but tracking. So if you're really fast at something, you've done it for, because I did this when I was pricing all of my sausages and I can like break down a turkey and in no time at all. I can break down a hog in no time at all. Um, but if I have somebody else coming in, they're a lot slower. So don't necessarily charge. Uh, so when, whenever I was pricing my products, I was looking at what it would cost if I had somebody else come in. So I'd have one of my kids break down a turkey. And how long does it take them to break down a turkey? Because that's what you're really doing is um, the if you get sick or something and you have to hire somebody to do it, you don't you want to make sure your stuff is priced properly. So I, I guess that would be uh, not I just really your time. Yeah, but. I really like that piece of advice because you're right. You you can do it faster than they can, but um, yeah. A good example is, so my, my husband and I were both um, packaging up chickens one day and I was finishing something up and so he was doing it and he was in the vacuum sealer. We can actually fit two chickens in there, but he was taking one chicken, standing there watching the vacuum sealer go all the way through and then taking it out and then weighing it and it's just like for me I was doing two chickens at a time and while I was waiting for the vacuum sealer to be done I'm already weighing I've already packed I've already got them you know on their way into the freezer I mean it was a significant time and did it make you want to pull your hair out watching him do it that way oh I pushed him away I was like that's it yeah. you're done no. <laughs> I came in I was like oh no 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 that's not how we do this off you go right <laughs> yep. I think it's probably part of the reason he was probably faster when I wasn't watching because he yeah. <laughs> he wanted to not be doing it anymore. Okay, so um, Miriam has a question. What is the shipping discount link? Um, she missed the name. If actually, we'll, um, if Katie, if you want to just send that to me, we'll put that in the follow up email. Yep. Um, so I then can everybody do that. Can I'll also put it here. Um, Shipstation.com is the one that I like, but getting ready for our webinar next week, I'm actually comparing prices across the a couple of different platforms. Um, ShipStation is really good for two day ground. Um, there's another one that in the past at least has been better if you're shipping via air, but we encourage two day ground. And I saw a question related to the radius of where people are shipping. Again, we encourage two day ground because if you are shipping via air, it is gonna get a lot more expensive. If, if Samantha tries to ship to California, it's gonna cost her a lot of money. But Samantha can probably ship almost almost anywhere east of the Rockies, two-day ground, I would guess, so. What yeah. I need to do is I would need to partner with a farmer in California. <laughs> that's and that's it. part of what Chop Local does is like, you know, we're pulling in farms from all over the country so that the customer can come and find meat that's close to them or raised to their standards, so. So Brendan has a question. Could you share your survey instruments? 
Um, I'm assuming he means the, the program that you used. I'll admit up front that it's really so I can know what data you might have specifically. I'm very curious how people are coping with having more live animals finished than they have customers. I generally sell finished animals to other direct marketing farmers who are better marketers than me, but I have to do that way in advance and then can't supply my own last minute direct customers. Wondering how others cope with supply and demand with live animal situation. We did not ask, okay, to answer the first question, we used SurveyMonkey is the tool that we used. If you wanted to see all the questions, the survey is closed now, but um, I could probably send you, I'm sure I can download a PDF of the questions or something like that if you wanted to see that. We did not necessarily ask anything along those lines, although I would say that you do not have an uncommon problem. Um, we, we've, there are, a lot of producers that were selling conventionally grain finished beef. And in that case, they can take it to a sale barn, especially right now, and get a decent price for it if it doesn't sell direct to consumer. People who are selling grass finished or more specialty niche type meats, they do have a problem if they scale up too quickly and they can't sell it direct to consumer. They don't have an outlet that will give them what they need price wise. So, um, not an uncommon problem, unfortunately, not one that I have a great solution for either. All right. Um, we've got another question here. This is actually in the chat, which is the nice thing about having enough time. Mm. <laughs> we can actually even, I can dig in the chat. Um, so I'm not quite sure who this is. Uh, Hannah, I think. Um, I think you said you you don't have this data, but I'm really interested in both the cost and time associated with scaling up and adding shipping. I am suspicious that there could be a sweet spot where you could just be just as profitable without increasing gross sales. Yeah, that's always something I'm thinking about too. I also want to know about employee numbers and payroll correlated with gross sales. Yeah, I we don't have, have that data, but I think you're exactly right, Hannah. And I think that that I do like spreadsheets. I'm not really great at them, but if you had somebody that could build you a spreadsheet where you said, um, once I get past this many animals, then I need more support, you know, and you can start to build up the scale that way. I think that that would be really interesting for you. Um, one thing, and I think Samantha would agree with me, is that in my opinion, having adding more beef cattle is different than adding a whole new species to your farm too, right? Um, so if you already have beef cattle and you're adding more of them, that's not the same as you already have beef cattle and you decide to dive into turkey production, which I know Samantha has some great webinars coming up on that. I was talking about it with another farmer. Turkeys are something else. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so that is one way to think about it. The other thing that I've talked about with some farms lately is that from an inventory management standpoint, you can have too many products that make things too complicated too. And so that's something else to think about, just your cut sheets. How many different products are you going to carry? Um, for time adding shipping, I can tell you that most of my farms are shipping one afternoon a week. So from a time standpoint, it doesn't necessarily, I mean, I know we're all very busy, but it's not like you have to find two hours a day to do your shipping. You're going to set out time once a week, going to get a system set up. I know the first time that I shipped meat, it took me like three hours to ship four boxes, but then <laughs> you start to get your system going. You know, I didn't have to wander around looking for the shipping tape the second time I knew where it was. <laughs> so, um, so you get a system going and it can be pretty efficient. And we do encourage people to look at if you're doing home delivery, what is that costing you in time versus the money? You know, it's always harder when we have to pay a bill and you see that money debited out of your account. But farmers, you got to you you got to value your time, too, because it's valuable. Yeah, no kidding. Um, so Fran asks, what are some of the best ways to get more comfortable with marketing, which I think is probably a question that a lot of people have, especially if they're just starting out. Yeah, I feel like. Um, I mean, you you just got to immerse yourself in some of the worlds and, and you've got to know that the first time that you start to listen or, you know, you start to watch these webinars, there are going to be phrases and concepts that make no sense to you the first time. And then you, over time, 
you're going to start to understand more of what those mean. And you'll look back and think, I can't believe how far I've come. I mean, like, honestly, I, I think about grain marketing because I'm involved in some women in ag groups here in Iowa and grain marketing is a very popular topic and I know nothing about it. We don't raise row crops on our farm, so we don't do any grain marketing, but I end up sitting through the, the presentations at the events, you know, and over the last 10, 15 years in ag, I remember the first time being like, I have no clue what they're talking about. And now out over time, I'm starting to go, oh, I get a little bit of it. Not, not as much as I'm not doing it, but um, there are some great resources. FACT has some great marketing webinars. We have some webinars. If you would rather read, we have a blog. Um, there are some great books out there. I really love the Building a Story Brand is a great marketing book. Um, Start with Why by Simon Sinek is a great marketing book. Um, I, I, I'm also a big fan of Facebook groups. So my team makes fun of me for how much I love Facebook groups, but. I love, I'm not a fan of Facebook groups. But You're not? I, oh, I'm I'm a nerd for groups, so. Oh, yeah. no, I can't stand them. <laughs> I don't know, I, I'm supposed to be in charge of one and I'm terrible. <laughs> but, um, so Corinna Bench with My Digital Farmer, if you're looking for a podcast, um, I got a lot because I, I used to be in that same position where I was really uncomfortable with marketing and then COVID hit and I had to get a lot more comfortable with marketing. I had to get an online store, all those things that all happened at once. And I started listening to Corinna Bench and her, especially her first like 10 or 11 um, episodes and you can, and they're short. They're like, you know, yeah. they're, they're like eating a little bit of candy here and there. It's just, uh, I, I listen to them on my way into my farmer's market every Saturday. I listen to them and I listen to them on the way home. And so that's yep. when I do it. But I really like Corinna's stuff too. She's very generous with giving out free advice and it's mm -hmm. spot on from what I've seen. So, yep, I think she's a great resource. Um, um, Aaliyah would like to know, how do farmers get listed on your site? We can talk about that another time if you would like, but we do, we charge a monthly fee because um, this is basically your sole online store if you're on Chop Local. That's the type of farm that we're looking for is that, you're shipping your USDA inspected cuts and you want this to be your main online store. So we do charge a monthly fee like other providers. Um, if you go to sell.choplocal.com, there's more information. You can fill out the form there and we can get in touch and chat. All right, Hannah would like to know, do you recommend building the price of shipping into the product or letting people know the cost of shipping? Or I guess are adding it on at the end. And, and you talked about that the last time you were on. <laughs> talked about that last time too. Totally recommend building it in. Um, psych, you know, psychologically from a marketing standpoint, it's really important that they don't get surprised with fees at the end. Uh, and so, yeah, we recommend building it in. And then if your platform can handle this, if you can do a an automatic discount for pickup for your local customers, then they feel like they're winning because they are getting this special discount and you're able to keep your pricing. Um, you know, you can price in the shipping costs, but then you can also not raise your prices for your local customers. Um, Brandon actually has a really funny comment. <laughs> And I totally get this. So just FYI, my take on the psychology of marketing aversion is that if I spend money on time on fencing, I get a fence field. Same with tractor repair. The tractor runs for a bit, uh, a bit. <laughs> cattle acquisition, I have the cattle. The fear of spending money and money on marketing is that you can spend money and see nothing. What if I open the storefront and nobody comes? What if I pay the SEO and nothing happens? I have nothing. My penny pinching psychology hates it. <laughs> And I, totally I get it. don't <laughs> disagree with you, Brandon. Like sometimes it feels like you're like just throwing spaghetti at the wall, right? And I'm not going to lie. Like that's part of why we did this survey is so that we can find out um, what is working. I didn't go into these results, but we asked um, specific marketing techniques about uh, of the farms again that were selling the most. Meat. Let me pull it up in front of me. It'll take me just a second. Um, I won't share, this is not a pretty screen to share with you, but I can at least <laughs> give you some numbers here in a second. So we asked about marketing techniques of the most successful. And when I say most successful, I mean the highest sales volume, just like we talked about. Um, and I will say that more of them are using email marketing. 
uh, than farms that are not selling as much. Um, and then, of course, they're all using Facebook. Some of them uh, Katie, are using Katie, Instagram. Katie, mm -hmm. is there any indication of, um, with the email marketing, how frequently they're doing the marketing? Is that a once a week or? We did not get that deep. Let me, I am going to share this screen with you, okay? It's it's not pretty for a, for a presentation, but it we won't we won't tell anybody about it. Oh, and I'm sharing the wrong our one. secret. <laughs> okay, hold on. Let me try this again. Okay, so do you see three columns here? Yes. All right. Whoops. Less than a hundred thousand, one hundred thousand to two hundred thousand, over two hundred thousand. This might be small. I apologize, and I'll try to quit clicking. But this was their comfort level with marketing. Um, we talked about that. What percentage of them have an online store? We talked about that. Marketing channels. So if I look at the most successful, 93% of them have a Facebook page, but that's not that much higher than the least successful. Almost everybody has a, a Facebook page. So no differentiator there. 87% using email marketing compared to 52% wow. selling less than 100,000. So it's it's not a surefire thing. Again, causation, correlation, I don't know. But um, Instagram, 85% versus 51%. Instagram is hard though, guys. I I, I don't know. <laughs> so um, Google business profile, you need to have it. It's, yeah. it's a mostly a set it and forget it thing. So just do it. It's super easy, yeah. Facebook group is 30%, 55 and 31%. So I wouldn't put my eggs in that basket. If I were trying to be a $200,000 farm, I would invest in email marketing. I'm a huge fan of email marketing or not even email marketing, but just having an email that you send out weekly. Yeah. I really think that has made the biggest difference for us. And we started it during COVID just because we needed to communicate when we, you know, when our market, if our market was going to be open, when it was going to be open and, and just, you know, because we had some of the markets that weren't open for a while. And um, so I started out doing that and I really, I mean, I hated it in the beginning. I complained bitterly to anybody who would ever listen to me, but now I really like it. I enjoy that time. It's like, I can really reflect on how the week went. I usually share if somebody, if somebody, I'm talking about my animals, like they're somebody's, um, if somebody did something interesting or, um, or just, and you know, I, it's really nice and um, yeah. I enjoy it and I have a connection and, and people comment on it and um, you know, it, it makes them feel more connected with me. Um, you know, you have to be comfortable, I guess, doing that, but I'm not a great writer. So it's not like I came into this as some English major who, you know, right. loves to wax poetic whenever they have a chance. I hate it. I'm, I'm a scientist. I'm a biology major and math. That's what I like. I like spreadsheets too, but <laughs> yeah, but it really does make a huge difference. I think everybody, if you do not, if you have not started developing your email list, get start tomorrow no don't start, start tomorrow start today start today yeah right yeah <laughs> no I would I would tend to agree with you um the other thing I'm going to find a different slide here the other thing last year I pulled this data out we asked what people thought was most effective and uh for finding new customers or what was hmm, I don't remember how we asked that and this was this year but one of the things that I found was that they thought that email marketing was very effective, but only 16 or 61% of them are using email marketing. We found saw the same thing. If you're selling more, you're more likely to be using email marketing. Um, but the other thing that we asked them was whether or not they were using Google Analytics to... Um, you see where their traffic is actually coming from. So people are putting a lot of time into social media and feeling like social media is driving their sales. But if you look at Google Analytics, that's not necessarily the case. So, okay, we've got a couple questions in the chat, Samantha. You're on mute. Do you want me to answer? Sorry, I, or not yeah, in my, the chat, my, in the Q and A. Somebody just showed up at the house, and so the dogs are super excited. Sorry. Um. So in the chats, I, I'm looking in the um in the Q and A. So I understand the marketing psychology twist and shipping and the per unit pricing, but isn't it better in the long run to have transparency and educate customers? 
In our utopian world, yes. But in our world of Amazon Prime, the reality is no. I mean, we go over some of this data. It's like 70% of stores online have free shipping. And if you want, if you really want to charge a shipping fee, I talk about that too. You have to run your numbers. You have to figure that out. If you run a, want to charge a shipping fee, set a flat fee. It may or may not cover all of your cost, but you set a flat fee and you let them know up front what that's going to be before they get to the checkout. Okay. Um, so that is, yeah, that's an option. Some people will do an upcharge for dry ice or something like that too. And that's an option, but um, bottom line, always tell them up front what that's going to be. And if you can keep it low, low is better. So Betty asks, do you need a CRM to have an email list? Okay, so CRM stands for Customer Relationship Management. Um, you do need to use an email marketing platform. I wouldn't necessarily call it a CRM. Mm -hmm. I myself love MailChimp. I've been using MailChimp for about 15 years. Um, I like MailChimp. I find it fairly easy to use. But again, I could In be here. biased because I've been using it. MailChimp is my go-to though, uh, but you should should not be sending it straight from your own email address. It's actually, a, you're not allowed to do that. You can get in trouble for that. You could get your, um, I've heard mm -hmm. lots of stories about people getting their email, their account closed because of it. That you have to have, an uh, the, the person who's receiving the email has to have an option to opt out. Yes. Um, and that's, otherwise it's, it's considered spam and junk mail and that kind of stuff. So you- And it you can be use... more likely to end up in their spam folder too. That's so, true. yep. That's true. Um, Heidi asks, uh, do you prompt people to comment back? Are there comments through email responses or on social media share of your email? So, no, I don't ask anybody to comment back. Are you talking about with your emails? It sounds like you're talking about with emails. Or are you talking about with the other social media accounts? I think she's, well, so on social media, I definitely want interaction. And, and I'm not saying use email instead of social media, but Social media, you want that interaction because that way more people see it. Um, in email, there are times where, and especially when, if you guys get on my email list, I'm going to say every time, if you need something from me, from me, reach out, just respond to this email and I'll get that email and I can respond to it. Um, but nobody else is seeing that. So it's really for us one-on-one. -on -one. Now, if you want the interaction, you use the social, but the email is more really for updates and announcements, less interactive type things. Right. All right. So we managed to do it, Katie. We, <laughs> Even though you I knew we could talk about it was fantastic. For an hour I love it. <laughs> anyway, because everybody has questions. It's, yes. I, I, I get excited about it. I'm very passionate about it. I think that there are huge opportunities with the technology that is available today. And like, we want to help all of you literally, whether you become a chop local vendor, whether you set up your own store, whether you're just going to do farmer's markets because technology is not for you. Like we want to help you get there. Okay. So, all right, Samantha, go ahead. <laughs> all right. So um, for those of you who came to our lambing webinar last week, our pre preparations for lambing, um, lambing webinar, um, we did. We decided to make that into a two-parter because there were so many questions. So that's actually going to has been added, and we will be doing that um, next week on the fourteenth. So we're going to have two webinars next week, which is going to be crazy, but it's going to be fantastic. But you can see all the different webinars we've got coming up. But that's a big one that just got added. So um, if you want to, uh, you'll get a, a link in the follow up. It's not on the website yet, but you'll get a link in the follow up email so you can sign up for that one. Um, a huge thank you to everybody. It's always amazing. You guys always have great questions. I love doing this. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, the recording of the webinar and slides will be available probably tomorrow. I'll get that to you guys. I'm not going to do it tonight. Um, but I'll do it tomorrow. Um, the uh, the webinar recording and a and the slides will be archived on our website. And we just so you can see, we've got a lot of really good webinars coming up, and I will send links to all of those. I'll also send the links to the things that Katie mentioned. 
Um, and I've, I think I've already got quite a bit of that from her, so I can send the links to that. I would suggest you, if you're interested, sign up for her webinar next week about shipping meat. I know I'm going to sign up for it. Um, and Katie, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to work with you. I enjoyed our webinar a couple of weeks ago, and I really have enjoyed today as well. You've got so much wonderful information. Um, and just really appreciate everybody out there. Um, I hope to see you guys next week for the two webinars. You guys hang out with me. Help me get through it. Two webinars in a week. Um, and um, yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you guys and appreciate everything. And goodbye yeah, for now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.